Oh, praise God. I know a lot of folks are away doing their thing. You know, I just had this one thing I wanted to say to you guys, this little story that I had. I mean, it was a, um, this boy is telling his dad, 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 uh, uh, is, is it good to eat bugs? Is good, bugs good to eat? And, and the boy's asking his dad, and the, the dad, he's, saying, he's still telling him, Son, so we don't talk about those things on the dinner table. <laughs> But dad, he says, son, what can I just tell you? We don't talk about those things on the dinner table. So after, after, after dinner, uh, the father addresses his son, inquires, son, now son, tell me, uh, what, did you, what, what were you asking me? What did you want to know? And the son says, oh, dad, uh, for nothing, dad, forget about it. He says, no, no, tell me. I want to know what you're talking about. What do you want to tell me? He said, well, there was a bug in your soup, and it was, oh. but it's gone now. <laughs> but sometimes we want to tell someone something, and we don't listen. You know? But, you know, what can you do, right? But I always say bugs are protein. Yeah. Yeah. They, they won't kill you, folks. They won't kill you. Hallelujah. Well, you know, we are interesting now, we're starting a series on uh, disciples' relationships, and it's all about love, folks. It's all about love. Now, love is a, and there are two topics that I've always had a hard time uh, actually ministering to. I say had because I no longer seem to have an issue with it. But it was always dealing with the topic of love and finances. And so we talk about love, and I want you to know that I'm, I'm going to talk to you basically on a dream that the Lord gave me last night when I was going to, I was preparing for this topic today. Now, we all know that uh, and this is important, this is essential what we need to know about love. Alright? And here's the thing. God is love. Turn to someone. God, God is love. God is love. See? And when the scripture in 1 Corinthians says, uh, love is patient and kind, love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude, it does not demand its own way, it is not irritable, it doesn't keep record of wrongs, it rejoices in it doesn't rejoice in injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth is out. This is love. Meaning, this is God. Now, when I was thinking about things, I've been hearing stories and, and testimonies today as to, you know, why is love so important? And, um, and, and in processing all of this, I had the scripture that says in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, it says, uh, let love be your greatest aim. I always had a hard time with love because of the way I was brought up. You know, I had a distorted view of love. How many of you have ever had a distorted view of love? Oh, yeah. See? A lot of people who are broken in a lot of ways have a distorted view of love. And I did. Growing up, I had a... a, a it was just... It was out of work, you know? I, I always thought love was weak. Weakness. You see? Because it had to sort of do with a lot of being sensitive compassionate, you know. It doesn't mean that I wasn't kind or a good person. I have to tell you that. But for some reason, because of the way I was brought up, there was a lot of things inside. You know, uh, Elder Marie said something in last week's message that, you know, what you get from the book is that so often we are still children, broken children yes. inside and living in an adult body. And we're never really healed. Right? And so we're making a lot of decisions based on this this concept. So we want to sort of look at that when you have a, a distorted view of love, you know, and uh, you know, some people may see, and I felt a little uncomfortable with talking about the topic because, you know, maybe people view me as, you know, and again, this is about thinking about other people's opinion, yes. although thank God no longer there. But I remember the concept of being able to wonder am I even capable of Giving love, showing love, because at one time I couldn't even hug my kids, not because I didn't love them, but because I never really knew one had it, never got it that way, and so that was the distorted part. And I'm going to go on with a lot of things that today as to why this concept is so important. And God, which is love, and I want you to understand, it doesn't say that He has love. It says He is love. I want you to, okay. this is a very important fact today. Everyone in the world is created to be and, and 
object of his love. Yes. Meaning we are created in his image and love is the key. Okay, this is, this is essential. So I want you to really understand this. For a long time, I couldn't even understand or relate to that. But I saw it as weakness. I see it totally different today. And, I'm, and based on the dream I got last night, it sort of really puts it in perspective for me. For, for me. And he doesn't say that, uh, uh, that love is, uh, it says it's prestige or possession or power or privilege or mo motivated by money. It doesn't say that that has anything to do with love. But the way I was brought up, a lot of that was that. It's what you could get or what you can give that sort of determines love. I got love with the way they fed me. And that's the way, you know, you give. And, you know, or, or, you know, not receive. And that was an image of love from my perspective. But, I'm going to give you a story in the Bible. If you turn your Bible to the book of Luke, chapter 10, 35. Well, 10, I think it's going to start at 35. And you know the story, but I'm going to give you the story, the book of Luke, 10, chapter 10. And uh, I want you to tell me if this is love, okay? Now, I'm going to, I'm going to start a little earlier. I'm going to start in verse 25, uh, because it starts on uh, chapter 10, verse 25. This is actually the parable of the Good Samaritan. And I'm going to read it, and then, then we have some things to talk about. All right, here we go. On, the, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to, the, to test Jesus. He says, teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus responds, what is written in the law? And he replied, uh, how do we read it, Jesus said. And he answered, oh, love the Lord God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And, you, and love your neighbor as yourself. I want to emphasize on that because that changed my life, that particular scripture, because it gave me a perspective of what is right. And even the law or the expert of the law quoted back the scripture which is correct, but when it's distorted, distorted, it causes something else. And here the law was stating that, you know, what actually is love, to love the Lord your God. When you get saved, that's the transformation. You can, if you get truly saved, you can't help but to love God. You see, something happens inside. Now, you could still be acting a certain way, but what happens inside starts to transform. Mm -hmm. Now, are you, are you still following me? I'm going to finish the story here so that you, so we get this, the whole picture. And so, he tells him, this is what is written. And he answers, this is what love is. Love the Lord your God with all these things. And you have answered correctly, Jesus replied to him. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. This is now the, the expert of the law. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Mm -hmm. huh? Okay, you get it so far? You follow? Because I want you to get this clear. This is the, 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 the expert of the law. And in reply, Jesus said, and here he goes. Tells him this parable, this story. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. When he fell into a, uh, at the hands of robbers, they stripped him and of his clothes, they beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. Verse 31. A priest happened to come coming along down that, that same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. Verse 32. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place where he saw him, Passed, passed on the other side. And then on verse, the other verse it says, But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and he bandaged, bandaged his wounds. He poured out oil he, and, and, and wine. Then he put him on, on the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, took care of him, and verse 35, and the next day he took out two silver coins, and that's a lot of money, by the way, and he gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Verse 36, 
Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robber? Verse 37. The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Is this love? Yes. yes. And to think about this because you find a lot of people, when I was coming on my way here today, see all these people sleeping right on the floor, right in front of the building, I mean, all over the place. Will you take him home? Will you take him somewhere and bandage, bandage him up? Would you, you know, do something for him, wake him up and see what he needs? And, you know, because if you were to compare it like that, see it that way, I think you wouldn't be functioning in a lot of love, will we? Now, it could be distorted when you see it that way. doesn't mean you want compassion for the people that are there, because what, what can you really do? Now, I had the dream last night. And before I tell you the dream, let me just emphasize a little of this. The expert in the law saw the man that was wounded, and he saw him as a subject to discuss. This is the expert of the law. A good discussion. The uh, robbers saw the man as what? Uh, someone to use and what? Expo exploit. But now these three next thing, I'm going to chew to finish it. The religious guy saw the man as what? Someone to be avoided. Okay. Work. Work. In his way. In his way. Good. Those are good. Those are good. Probably so many the Samaritan. Yes. No one to be despised. Well, it was a, a problem to be avoided. That's what they. That's how the religious people saw it. The innkeeper saw the man as a what? That's right. That's right. He saw it as a customer and had to serve for a fee. But the Samaritan saw him, saw him as a human being worth being cared for and loved. Now this is where this comes in. Last night I had this dream because I knew I was preparing for this. I didn't have much time to prepare because of all that my, my schedule this week was like really intense. I did a, a wedding yesterday, a rodeo wedding. <laughs> a rodeo wedding, yes. I tell you, my first world rodeo wedding. You know, cowboy hats and everything. Okay, I, I was texting Sir, he was at the game. I said, like, this is exciting, this is fun. You know? But it, it was exciting to do. But anyway, the dream was this. I, I found myself uh, amongst uh, unscrupulous people. I was hanging around with unscrupulous I don't know what I was doing, I was just doing some things that were there. And, and so in that particular dream, and when I get up in the morning, and I'm, not, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give you the rest of the dream, but I'll tell you what the interpretation was when I woke up, the Lord gave me the interpretation. But in the dream, I was with unscrupulous, unscrupulous people, and then all of a sudden I was with my son, one of my youngest son, I think it could have been Sir or Asher, and we were walking away from you know, the activity I was doing. And my son was running around, and he went way ahead of me, and I'm watching him, and this woman bumps into this woman, and the woman knocks him down and starts to kick him. And I run, hey, and I chase the woman. And there's a pool, and she jumps in the pool to try to avoid me, so I don't get her, she's trying to cross, and I'm crossing the pool by this little path, and I catch up to her, but she finally dives into a baby pool where her husband is laying down uh, in that baby pool. And she turns around, faced up, and she said, this is my husband. And I, and I recognized the guy, her husband, which is one of the unscrupulous, scrupulous individuals that I knew. And I'm ready to, to, you know, but then for some reason, I have some grace. And I stop from doing anything I wanted to do. Then I wake up, and the Lord said, this is a reminder of what you did when you were unsaved. And he gave me a, a, a reminder of when I was unsaved, I saw an individual once 
that was in a real bad position. Alcoholic, drugs, out on the street, ragged. And I took her home. And I took care of this person. And I nurtured this person. And the person was back to health. I invested in this particular person. Matter of fact, she babysitted my son for a while. Not something that I could take credit for because something in that moment happened to make me have compassion. I can't even explain why I would even do that. That's not the first time I've done that when I was unsaved because I used to always, for some reason, and to take no credit at all, something inside said, do this. And I did it. Without even thinking about it. It wasn't me, I have to tell you, because I probably wouldn't do something like that. To be honest. But when the Spirit moves, whether saved or not, that is when true love is really manifested. Because you know you can't take credit for that. I, could, I didn't even remember that till he reminded me of that particular situation that day. Now that's when I was not saved. Can you imagine something that I can share with you today when I was saved? So what I'm trying to get at is that we can't take credit when the Spirit of the Lord moves in us. But when we allow the Spirit to move in us when He does, amazing things happen. Maybe not the guy laying in the street right now out there, but if the Spirit were to move, and we were ready, it would happen. I, I can't even figure out, wow, what, what possessed me to go and take this person home, nurture them, take care of them, and all of that. See? Sometimes we don't wonder, how is that possible? How can we do that? There were many times that I risked my life in situations that were very dangerous, but something inside said, do that. And today I can think and look back and say, I can't take credit for that because it wasn't written. I would not have done that, to be honest. In the natural. In the natural. There's no way you can do it. But because we are in the image of God, so often we see things, we can get distorted and see that, you know, even the enemy would say, well, you love God so much, would you take that person home? I can't do that. Don't even know what the kind of problems that person has. I don't even know what that person, you know, I don't know. But if the Spirit of the Lord would have part upon you, that would be an issue. Bang. That's what happened to that man, Samaritan, that did that. Because the Spirit of the Lord has to give you that. Not even the expert of the law could do that. Not even the religious leaders could do that. Unless the Spirit of the Lord would lead. That is love because God is love. God has a life passion. There is something that motivates uh, his every action. First Corinthians tells you, he doesn't say that it's about the material things that we could earn or the stuff that we have. It has nothing to do with that. These stories are, is, are amazing. Now, he was another portion of love and, and his, the Lord reminded me of these particular stories that he's given me. But I want you to keep in mind uh, of what, what, the, what the scripture is saying about, if you have your Bibles, I want you to write down 1 Corinthians 16, because we're going to go to that scripture verse in a minute. One day Jesus was walking down the street, and a guy comes up to him and says, Lord, what is the most important commandment in the Bible? And Jesus said, uh, uh, I can't summarize this, the entire Bible for you in, in two sentences, right? And what does he say? He says, if you get these two things, get this purpose, to that, this in your life, right now, you'll be set. He said, the greatest commandment of Jesus is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, your mind, all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. I say that again. Why? Because it's not about us. It's about meaning again, understanding that we are the image of God, and that image of God is in love. Yes. In loving people. But some people may not uh, receive your love because... So often is how they see you should love. Mm. 
You know, and people want to put demands on you how you should love. How you should love me on my terms. That could be challenging, right? Because then it's about, you know, you, if, you, if you don't do it my way, then it's not love. He said nothing in the Bible is more important than these two, two key phrases. I see love as an investment. To love your neighbor, you have to be invested. What does invested mean, folks? Huh? Okay. Put it in and stay in it. Okay. Anybody else? Good. Does it mean to be invested? You put something in. You're gonna get something back out of it. You get something out. You get out of it. You're gonna get something back out of it. Okay. What you say, uh, Chief? Same thing. Same thing. Anybody else? Sacrifice. Because you don't, an investment, you don't get it right away. No. You don't get it right away. And I don't mean in a year or two. A true investment may take a lifetime. You see, an investment is not, you can't depend on it. Turn to someone, you can't depend on it. So when you love, it doesn't mean don't expect any return at, at, at any time soon. But again, how individuals see this? And, I, and I'm looking at the scripture and studying and wondering, oh, whoa. And the Lord reminds me of, of another story. But now he gives me the scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13, 14. He says, be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be men of courage. Be strong. Do everything in love. But what interpretation do you have of love? And again, we've got to be very careful. Today. He says five things here to say. He tells us to be stern. Now, this is what's taking place here is that Paul coming to visit Corinthian church, and he's telling them, you know, this is what I need you to do because I'm going to come, and I'm going to stay with you guys a while. And he's telling them all this because Paul is under persecution. So when Paul's under persecution, whoever he encounters is going to go under what? The same persecution. Same so when you are investing in people and they're going to come, he's going to say, listen, be on your guard, be prepared because, you know, this is, you know, when you're serving the Lord, things are going to happen. But love, as the scripture says, love conquers all, folks. Love never fails. That's because God never fails. Amen. See? That's because God conquers all. And if you are in his image, the same blessing goes on to you. You are more than a conqueror. conqueror. These are the scriptures that reinforce the concept of love. Now, I want you to think about investment. Because there was a story the Lord reminded me many years ago. I uh, uh, had a, a situation with a young man who was, he was really troubled. Really troubled. But he was a pretty big kid for his size. And this is when I was a youth pastor and I worked with kids. And I worked with a lot of troubled kids. God gave me a gift to, to have compassion for these particular kids. I could endure all their stuff. And in the love that he gave me to have for them, it was like no problem. As a matter of fact, I welcomed it. It was a piece of cake for me. Because he gave me the gift to do that. So I had this one particular kid who was so out of control with his anger. And he would hurt, literally, because he was so big, hurt by the kids. And one day he put, he was ready to really hit a kid, really he was really in a bad mood. And I had to grab him, and he was really light-skinned, so when I, I left my prints on him, trying to hold him so tight, because he was a pretty big kid. So it, it, got, it got a little out of control. And so, uh, you know, we had to get his mom to come in, and, and the Lord tell me, this is what you're going to need to tell her. Mm. I wouldn't have kicked the kid out at all. And she would have left the kid in because she understood and knew who I was. Now, they, you know, some of you know me and some of you know that I can be very strong-willed, very hard, but it's always in love. You know when I used to call marshmallows? 
It was the way I came out. It wasn't. It wasn't uh, derogatory. It wasn't to put them down. It was never that way because they never took it that way. But it was no a form of motivation that they could understand. You know, we talk strong kids, and that's kids that are out of control. You gotta speak their language. Because if you don't speak their language, someone else who sees it from the other way may not see that language. But there's one thing that God gave me that was incredible. Can't take credit because he's the one that did it. There was always a way for me to reach. So this kid, I had his mother come in, and the Lord said, this is what you need to tell his mother. So I told his mother, listen, you need to take your son out. I'm not kicking him out in at all. But so your son needs you to stand up for him. That would mean that I would have to look like the bad guy. His best friend, which is one of the kids in the church, his family was in the church, saw me as the bad guy. He literally had some hate towards me because this kid's mother took him out. And he didn't understand why I would do that. But the kid felt secure that his mother stood up for him and it helped him in his relationship with his mom. He was a, he was a single parent mom. So she took him out because that was so important that she showed him love that way. Mm -hmm. But then he left me looking like what? Yeah. I had to do what I had to do at this point, but I knew that that concert the other young man, I couldn't tell him the situation. He would have never understood. It was only two, maybe a year or two later that this young man's mom was passing away and the family calls me to help him. At that, that troubled young man, at that point, understood everything and we developed a relationship. When he was young, he couldn't understand me. Now that I was there helping support the family and was there for that family. He saw so different. And then when he told the kid from the church who resented me for years, he had a change of heart. Because now he understood what I had to take place. Sometimes the investment That's right. may not work out the way you got planned. See? God has a plan and a purpose for everything, right? So he goes, he says, be on your God, stand firm in the faith. He said, be men of courage, be strong, and do everything in love. As the Christians uh, awaited for his visit, they, they, they were, this is what they were directed to do. Now, when he says, be on God against spiritual dangers, right? What do you see? What kind of dangers do we have to be on God for? What kind of spiritual dangers are we talking about? Think about it a minute. Because these, these are the spiritual dangers that we face when we are really functioning in the capacity of loving others. He said to everything in love. Right? So here is be on, be on God against spiritual dangers. What kind of dangers? Enabling. Enabling. See? Yes. Rejection. Rejection. That's a big one, by the way. See? Lies, deception, see, dysfunction. But then he says the second one, he says, stand firm in the faith. What is he telling them? Hold on to what you know. That's right. Hold on to the truth. Because the truth is what? It's the one that sets you free. The lies are going to try to come in to deceive you and throw it, get you to react emotionally. He gets you to do these things. Sometimes someone may not understand where you're coming from. But we have to hold on to the truth. That to stand in faith. But remember that inner person inside as distorted may see things differently. They may not understand. Three, it says behave courageously. What is he saying with that? He's telling you to be courageous. What is he telling you with that? He's saying it's really facing the reality that, you know, that the courage is, have is doing things even though fear is there. It's not letting fear control. 
Even though the fear is there, you work through it. Because the fear, there are many fears that will keep you from being feeling rejection or fear of losing or failing, all those things. Fear is, is, is a tool of the enemy. Because the Bible, Bible says that God did not give you a what? Spirit Spirit of fear. Of fear. The other one says be strong. What did he mean by be strong? Talking about endurance, endure, persevere, work through it. Just like muscle works, we gotta sometimes work through the pain to develop. And the last one that I put there, he says, do everything with kindness and in love. See, the only way you can do that is uh, dependent uh, on what the Spirit gives us that way we can invest. First John 4 7 8 says, Love comes. From God, for God is love. The reason why God wants you to love is because He is love. And you have been created in His image. That's what makes the difference between the rocks and the plants. God gives us the ability to be sacrificially loved and love each other. He says, God disciplines those he loves. Now, we have a distorted, remember, because of our disciplinary uh, upbringing, those who discipline us growing up, we can have a distorted version of what love uh, discipline is. But that concept says it's about teaching and training. Even when I said before, a coach, you know, says, you know, you march, you know, get up, let me see you push it. You know, it's all in love. Not meant to knock you down. But when we get defensive, we lose sight of what that really means. We love because God loves us. Otherwise, it's not the essential of what love is. God always sets the example by taking the initiative. How does he take the initiative? What did he do? He sent his only begotten son. So you want to look at it that way. Sometimes people get down on themselves and they feel like, you know, I was listening to Jay share earlier. Hello? She <laughs> <laughs> uh, said earlier about a uh, friend sharing about a friend that had uh, been in the church for long periods of time. And so often, it's almost like it says in the book of Revelation that in the end days, even believers are going to be falling away. Because again, you get the, the repetition, the constant doing the same old thing. Folks, if we're not growing, that's exactly what would happen. But to grow, you're going to have to work. It doesn't happen automatic. You can continue getting comfortable the way things are, and it's only a matter of time. Because once you get complacent. But those who are constantly in developing their relationship with the Lord will grow beyond anything they could ever even expect. When he gave me the, the, the interpretation of the dream, 